evening and welcome to tonight's study session. We'll call the meeting to order. And the first item on the agenda tonight is the trails implement implementation update. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate you giving us the time to talk a little bit about trails. Oops. <laughs> so with every uh, program and project, we always like to tie it back to the strategic plan. Um, obviously, one of the key focus areas from the council uh, included infrastructure. And underneath that was a goal of increasing the trail system uh, 5% annually over five years. Um, what's interesting about that is if you think about that, you know, that sentence 5% annually over five years, you know, it kind of raises a few questions. Is that an extra 5% in length or is that 5% in, you know, what is it? But for today's purposes, we are going to look at it as focusing on urban trails. We do have 17 miles of trail up at CG Mountain. I don't believe that our plan is to increase that a mile a year. You know, 5% of that would be approximately a mile a year. We would run out of land up there and, and we have a lot of trails already up there. So anyway, we feel like we're in really good shape up there on CG Mountain. Um, as we get into this presentation, we want to make sure that we keep in mind that we already have a regional trail system master plan in place. There was a lot of work done in the mid 2000s. Uh, many people in this room uh, participated in that uh, regional trail master plan. It was presented to the council and it's embedded into the general plan. So the good news with that master plan is, is all of the planning and zoning that Mr. Tice and his crew are doing, uh, trails are, are considered in that plan. That plan does and define potential trail options, potential locations, potential trailheads, and cross sections of different types of trails. Very extensive work. If we look at our current inventory, CG Mountain is probably our most extensive trail system. Obviously we have 17 miles of marked trail up there on the mountain. Uh, the trail is native soil and rock surface. It's a fairly narrow trail, what might be termed a single track trail. Um, that does have over 2,500 feet in elevation change and, and was built definitely with the volunteer system, um, some staff involvement, and the AmeriCorps group helped a lot with this construction. I will use Car McNatt as our most recent um, trail development. Uh, trail is probably a loose term over there at Car McNatt. It's more of a walking path. But I did want to recognize it because it does have a stabilized granite surface, um, which is bordered in concrete there at that park. But the stabilized granite surface is a great surface for future trails. Um, you know, you could use asphalt or concrete, but this um, is, is a great surface that's ADA compliant, can be used by hikers, bikers, um, any, any sort of trail use that we want, multi-use trail. It's approximately 645 yards long and um, 14 foot wide there, Car McNabb. We do have some urban trails in the city. Um, the San Carlos East Trail is a nine foot wide trail, asphalt, approximately a half mile long. It, it crosses, um, which street is that? Trekle, Trekle Road over by Palo Verde School. And yeah, it goes in east-west um, design. And this map shows where that's located over by Palo Verde School Crossing Trekle. It doesn't really have a trailhead, and it, it just starts and stops at the road there. The San Carlos West Trail, again, a nine-foot wide paved surface. It crosses a major street near the CG Middle School. It crosses Pinal at that point. Um, again, going east to west, and it, it has crossing several streets, but uh, starts kind of over there by the Salvation Army and loops around CG <coughs> School. <laughs> and, and this map just shows the, the location of that trail. 
Both of those trails are included in our regional master plan. Then there's also a current trail out at Mission Valley. It's a 10 foot wide paved surface, loops around the Mission Valley development. Um, it's our most extensive trail as far as modern build um, with lots of landscaping and lots of amenities. And of course it's kind of starts and stops again without really a trailhead or um, connecting anything in particular. <clears throat> So if we talk about current trail plans for the current fiscal year, um, we are planning today in, during this current fiscal year to build a small spur trail connecting the recreation center over to Colorado Street to give access, walking access to um, the recreation center from the developments there to the west of the recreation center. Um, the most recent picture isn't, isn't uh, very recent as the rec center was under construction when that picture was taken. It didn't look like a good parking lot. Yeah, yeah. So Google Earth hasn't updated that picture. But, but we are planning during this fiscal year to build that little spur trail uh, connecting over to Colorado Street. Um, we are also in negotiations with the company to work at CG Mountain. And what we're planning at CG Mountain is a trail assessment um, very similar to what we would do with the pavement maintenance program. We want to assess those trails up there and prioritize plans for the next five years so that we can start budgeting for trail maintenance and or trail um, adjustments because as those trails up on the mountain, sometimes there's social trails that develop or maybe unsafe areas and so we want to make sure that we're prioritizing those and recognizing those and making adjustments as we need to. Of course, the um, also up on the mountain, we would like to start a biannual maintenance plan. Um, current maintenance up on the mountain is done through a variety of staff and volunteers, and we want to take a little bit more formal approach to the maintenance on the mountain to protect our assets. Can I ask a quick question? When we sure. have, uh, I say a severe storm, where we have a lot of water or whatever. Did somebody from the city go out and take a look and make sure those trails are not essential that are, are dangerous? Sure, we, we do um, look at the trails from time to time. Obviously with 17 miles, um, there's a lot of area to, to look at and maintain. And that is one part of this plan is to look at those. Um, and I guess I was talking about, you know, every a couple times this year we've had a lot of runoff in that. And when it's extraordinary, does somebody go, oh gee, that was quite a washer, let's go take a look. And Rod, can you comment on yeah, that? Yeah, we can, uh, sometimes we get the user groups, they'll, they'll contact us and say there, there is a, a wash that seems to be pretty bad. And then sometimes they'll actually step forward and say, we're going to go out there with a little crew next weekend and, and work on that. And, and usually I know that they've already have experience in doing the proper trail okay. maintenance and, and building because they worked with us when we, when we built the trail complex out there. So uh, I was confident in, in, any, in these few groups that they can they can do those jobs. <clears throat> One good thing up there on CG Mountain is Rod and his crew did a great job with the volunteers um, building sustainable trails that can withstand erosion. And obviously you're going to have erosion anytime you have natural state trails like that. But, but uh, we, we have done a small assessment of it and everything's in pretty good shape right now. So, yes. One of the uh, things that, that would be really good at CG Mountain is is the dirt one at the base for equestrians and for people that want to walk that can't climb and just and there's some roads there that uh, exist that would probably work for that now and then coming around uh, on the west uh, clear to the back would uh, a lot of guys want to take their horses out there and ride and. You don't want to get them up high on the trails with the rocks and, sure. and that type of thing. So that would uh, be inexpensive as far as just a dirt trail. And I've, I've seen a lot of people that go out to hike and they don't hike up, but they go down those, those roads and, and uh, walk through the desert and come back. And, and we probably have some unmarked trails out there, yeah, don't there's, we? There's a lot of social trails. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of um, you know, kind of, for lack of a better term, Jeep trails and things that are out there. But uh, a big majority of those aren't even on city property. 
so we wouldn't be able to actually develop those or, or include them in our in our mapping. But we don't discourage people to really use them if they don't if they're just going to hike out there and do you know equestrian use or something yeah. like that. Um, it would be up to the landowners that are there. And, and right now we're boarded with uh, you know uh, you know county property owners, city of Casa Grande property owners, uh, uh, the military. Uh, base there and things. So, so we have a lot of different entities that own a vast majority of property that surrounds the city of Cass Grants property. The around the base on the west side is is pretty much a dirt road anyway, yeah. which which works yeah. good for equestrians. Ice Ice and Road and, and yeah. Camp and things too. All right. Um, so that brings us to our options for the future. Um, if we look into future fiscal years and really what we wanted to get some direction from the city council and, and kind of throw out the ideas that we have as staff. Um, our staff proposal would be to develop a trailhead at Rotary Park for the, the first section of the Casa Grande Community Trail. We own all of the land along the wash um, and I'll go to the next slide so you can see. Along the wash between Treckle and Peart. Um, which connects with Rotary Park. So we feel the most cost-effective way to develop the first mile of urban trail would be to start in this particular area and work from Rotary Park east over to Peart Road. And um, if we could accomplish that in the next couple of fiscal years, um, that, would, that would give us our, our first real mile of urban trail that, that would be a multi-use trail that would be hiking, biking, equestrian all the way through. Also, um, a very cost-effective way to continue to develop some of our trails would be to potentially put a loop trail in Ed Hooper Park. Um, recently, the city purchased extra land out at Ed Hooper Park. Uh, it's not designated for park use at this, this time, you know, with, with fully developed park, but it would be very suitable for hiking, biking, and equestrian. Um, our staff's proposal would be to build a 3.1-mile loop um, the 3.1 miles is a 5K. We, we have quite a few groups that run 5Ks or want to run 5Ks, and it would be a great way to have a low maintenance native soil type trail. Um, we would probably plan on limited infrastructure in that area because we, that area could be used for future park use for a fully developed park. So you would hate to build something and then tear it down later. There's a social trail right now that leaves the rodeo grounds and goes up uh, next to the trailer park area mm -hmm. and then goes and people go up the wash toward the airport and then you can cross over the dead, you go know, clear over to the mine. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, that way out riding and, and, and there's quite a bit of use of that. And this picture on the right down the lower right is one of those social trails through that section of land. Yeah. The picture on the left is what it could look like if you developed a low maintenance native trail. Um, as we look to the future beyond, beyond those years, um, beyond 2020, to develop, further develop the community trail, we would need to acquire land, um, land agreements, developments so that we can go east and east of Pier and west of Treckle. Um, our plan would be to, to propose those community trails in the CIP when the land and funding become available. Um, one of our goals would be to connect Dave White Park to Ed Hooper Park, connect Dave White Park to Mission Valley, and connect the Recreation Center up to that trail. And that's depicted in this, this rough uh, map that's on the next one. This map just shows um, the green is the existing trail over by Mission Valley. The red would be the next couple of years, fiscal years, if we can build the rec center trail down there below, and then that first mile of trail at Rotary Park. Um, the Ed Hooper Loop Trail would just be in that section somewhere. We would probably <coughs> self-design that and fit it within that land that's available. And then the blue sections would be into the future land that we currently don't own completely, but land that we is currently earmarked for the trail. And uh, 
you know, if you could imagine getting on your bicycle at the rec center, riding it out to Dave White Park and back, that's, you know, that would be our longer term goal. This one comes along the Santa Cruz or has been planned for along the Santa Cruz route. Yes, and, and again, Mr. Tice's group has been um, working with developers and landowners in those areas. Um, it's earmarked in our, in our trail master plan for um, future trail use. A lot of the earlier uh, developments that went in gave us, gave us uh, trails. They went ahead and, and said you could use this uh, different ways through their uh, developments for trails. I don't know how many of those still exist or if they were a thing of the past or what. But. No, I think most of them exist, maybe yeah. not in a formal basis. In it's certain in areas. the agreement. Some of them are informal. Yeah, there, it sits there in the agreements, and sure. I always kind of wondered about formalizing yeah. and connecting those. Matt? So uh, I had a meeting with uh, Larry and Steve and Steven, and we were talking about this about, what, just two months ago maybe, or uh -huh. November. Um, and we kind of, you know, we had the Trails Master Plan. If you haven't read it in a while, it's, it'll put you to sleep. But, I mean, it is, it's fantastic in its detail. It's hard to read. Uh, I mean, just because of the sheer size of what they took in. So we kind of looked at it as, as a way to be, you know, now with the rec center and kind of making that the first hub of the trail system or, you know, everything going to the rec center because that's kind of what we're promoting and then going out to eventually to CG Mountain, to Dave White Park, you know, and then north to uh, Belago Park, hopefully. And we talked about also the gas line road, mm -hmm. if that was a possibility because that's an, an easement that can never be built on um, a good walking area. And so um, they did a they did me a great favor and they printed me a map and it's this big and it's really cool of all the proposed trails and and what we have so we started working with that and that's kind of where this came out of um, the the newest thing I heard tonight was the the Ed Hooper Loop Trail for a 5K which I think is a great idea because a lot of organizations want to have a 5K you've already got the parking lot right there you have a natural gate into the area so to speak. Everyone can park there. You can register, have the water set up, and all that, and then and do that. So I thought that that was a great idea. And then we we talked about the new walking track at uh, Car McNatt kind of being one of our prototype uh, trails to start with because it's uh, not a very expensive way to build a trail. I mean, ideally, we'd like to have maybe pavement or I've been looking into this rubberized recycled tire coating, which drains really well and everything. But I mean. We could probably do a quarter of a mile a decade. <laughs> We'd have to get some more money in order to do that. But, it's better on your joints yeah. than anything else. Um, but but that's, that's and we could pave, we have our own paving uh, machine that we could do small projects like this perfect. But we're trying to take the low hanging fruit first and make sure that we can, you know, get the trail system going because once we have the trail designated, we can always improve the surface of the trail. But let's get people out there using it. Let's get something done, and that's going to, you know, help with our goal of getting the trails built, getting people out there, and using them, actually. Because once we get people using them and they know about them, then we're going to have a lot more success with our trails. And lastly, the other neat thing, so I was going to ask about the maintenance at CG Mountain, and you guys already have a plan for that, because that's a great asset out there. And uh, we did really good getting the volunteers to build it, but so we need to keep it up, but you guys were two steps ahead already. So, um I appreciate that, but I'm really excited about the, the rec center trail we kind of came up with because it goes naturally to Colorado, then you can go up the road and walk over to different um, subdivisions without having to go across some real busy roads and stuff like that. So it's exciting. Thank you. Sure. And, and one thing that when we're talking about this type of trail, um, and like you said, the Car McNatt walking path is a good prototype. Um, if we can get this the rec center spur trail built this year, you'll see the prototype. Um, think of it differently than just a five foot sidewalk. You know, a five foot sidewalk does connect, but a trail is a bigger connector that is multi-use. And so we wanna kind of set the stage that we're not just trying to connect town with just five foot sidewalks everywhere. Although that's still part of a, a typical roadway. Part of it, yeah, if you, if you read the trails master plan, there's deep elevations of how to build a trail and everything, but we thought that the, uh, the the granite surface would be a great way to start. And also, like you said, 
sidewalks are sometimes uninviting in your yeah. joints and everything too whereas it's something that's a better surface and we can share it with horses and bikes and walking and dogs and yeah. strollers and everything sidewalks else are one of the worst things to walk on as an exercise mm -hmm. to run or walk that's why you see so many people on the pavement is because it's then on, on concrete or cement so yeah that's why i don't run on <laughs> I, know. I do mine in a car. Yeah. Oh, you got your little thing. A, a couple of things that we want to recognize before we go too much farther is the opportunities and the challenges that we have in place today. Um, obviously, some of the opportunities are that we have a trail master plan in place. You know, extensive mapping. Um, Matt laid it out very well that the trails master plan has a lot of information that's very detailed and very technical and was a great job done so the, the master plan is in place also it's already a goal of the strategic plan by the city council so it that's another great opportunity and another one is that we still have chances to adjust the plans nothing's laid out in stone yet and so we can make these adjustments here at the beginning and lay it out in a, in a good way um, you know one of i think parks and rec people look at it as connecting our parks together you know so that you can connect your city to major things and um, connecting the recreation center over to Dave White Park would be just a great opportunity where you could, you know, go east to west across town very easy. Obviously, the challenges that we have are the limited budget that we have available. Um, uh, you know, we'll be proposing these in the next CIP and, and <coughs> trying to come up with some budget figures for that. Uh, we in certain areas, we still need access to the land. I feel that uh, with some staff help, we can achieve all of those. And some, you know, that first mile of trail from Pier to Treckle could spur on some of these developments as people want to be part of that trail. And then another challenge is whenever you do something that's planned in small segments like this, sometimes you can get lost and never complete anything and end up building the trail to nowhere. So we just want to make sure that we keep that in mind and we're not building something that's um, you know, starting at Rotary Park, something that we already own, we feel is a, is a great start and gets us in a, in a good place. Yes. Just one comment on the, on the rodeo grounds. The, uh, the trail, it, if you take flight, needs to make sure it doesn't come through the rodeo grounds because the last thing you want is a lot of people with kids or whatever sure. crawling into pens and somebody might get kicked or hurt. And, uh, no, and it, it would be, have to be totally separate. Exactly, and it, it could come on the frontage where the, uh, up just off the highway where you could walk straight, straight down. <coughs> if, you know, if you want to go over by the ball field or take your dogs to the, the park or whatever. Well, I, you know, for the loop trail, I think that we can use all the area west of the yeah. rodeo grounds and not even come close to the rodeo grounds and still get yeah. 3.1 miles in there pretty easy. Well, that, that, uh, that's a neat ride. Yep. Steve, I have a question on the, uh, you know, <clears throat> having been part of CG Mountain and the trail building with Rod, you know, we were so fortunate to use the AmeriCorps group and stuff. In any of these plans for these type of trails, is there an opportunity for us to go back and look at that group coming back in again, or is it something that's not conducive to that? No, I think it is. I think anytime that, you know, as we advance this proposal, we're gonna to have to look at cost creative ways to do it, mm -hmm. whether it's in-house um, with AmeriCorps, with grants, in, anything like that, because um, I, I've gotten, just today, I've gotten some information um, and it was, it was done by the Flagstaff Regional Trail Strategy so they, and it was in November of 2019, so pretty good costs, or I mean, pretty good recent information. And, uh, you know, they're predicting a, a mile of trail surface is 350 to 500,000, and a mile of paved, like concrete, really <coughs> up to date surface is a million dollars or more per mile. So we have to be creative and find ways to um, do it within our budget. And, and I think. Rod and I have some, you know, some plans that we're going to work with. Uh, we've, we've got a company that we're working with right now that's going to do the trail assessment, and they'll give us some better guidelines on, on you know, how we can do this sustainable and still do it, um, 
within the budget that we have. This this last uh, last summer, I went to a meeting up there for the uh, <coughs> Natural Resource Conservation had a, a meeting there, and they actually took us out by Fort Tut Hill and showed us some of the trails and how they'd done some of the thinning in, among the trees and that type of thing. And then they had a canyon that came by and and dirt on the bottom. I mean, you just walked along, but it was really pretty. Sure. And and I don't think any services at all were on any of those trails, but they're pretty well used. You'd see people out walking on them, and, and uh, it'd be worth your time when it gets real hot to run up there and take a look. So. <laughs> and, and, you know, we can definitely start that trail, you know, from yeah. Rotary Park with just a natural surface and, and sure. by doing the clearing. And you just have a few unknown costs like engineering costs and and we'd try to keep the design cost to a minimum, but you also want to make sure that you do have some input there because it is near a wash, and you'd hate to do anything and then have it just washed away at the next big rain. So uh, there are some considerations like that. Uh, just a, a compliment on the effort to build a trailhead at, at uh, Rotary Park and then down that wash. Um, that. Uh, that area, I think, has long been uh, an untapped uh, treasure uh, of our community. Uh, a lot of people don't, don't even know it exists. You know, they've never been there. Um, some of us have been in and out of that wash since we were kids. You know, we, we would hike it, bike it, <coughs> motorcycle ride it, all, all of that. So that's going to be a great place for a trail. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about that. Right? <laughs> but uh, I was going to ask a question. Um, you mentioned the, um, the trail of uh, Mission Valley, and uh, I was reminded that in Vilago we have a lot of that same uh, type of walkways that, that go through the neighborhood and then connect with Vilago Park. It goes around the lake, all of that. And I guess my question is, is there a possibility or what's the process of having different areas like that identified in our trail system? Do we have to own the property or how does that come about? Well, we, I'll just kind of take it here because I was there during uh, when we talked to developers and things during the boom mm -hmm. and uh, they were all on board with, with trying to be uh, uh, coexistence with, with our trail system and blending it with theirs. And we talked about some things like if, if they had uh, areas where, you know, was on to more of the major trails or something that the city would actually of the hard surface itself, kind of like streets. Mm -hmm. And so we'd be that part. And then the developer and the HOA would take care of all the landscaping and things that were that were coming off of this the edge of the trail. Mm -hmm. So we, we we talked about those things and we talked about those uh, we could negotiate those things during uh, PADs and, and like that. But there there was a lot of buy-in for trying to make sure that our trail system would would connect with uh, each development and things as they come on board. So so we see things like Vilago where they're kind of. They're kind of halfway done with their system too, or not even halfway, but they're they're done with a percentage of their system also, and and their hopes is that when their when their system ends, it should meet up with something of ours or another development, and you might have two or three developments together that that would okay. end up making a connector to to our trail system. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. And and I didn't in our current inventory, I didn't include any of the the HOA owned type trail systems that are out there almost every development has some <coughs> internal trails within their development so okay all right thank you any other questions or comments very good thanks steve thank you thank you all right next item is the uh, discussion related to council chambers av update project stephen Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about some upgrades to the Council Chambers here and also the production room up at the top. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the background of how we've got here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris um, from Audio Visual Innovations to kind of go over the details. So staff advertised for a request for qualifications back in June of 2019. The city received qualifications from four different fir firms a committee consisting of employees from the PIO, city clerk, IT, and city manager offices uh, were a part of that committee, and we interviewed four firms. 
and selected audiovisual innovations as a firm that the committee felt had the most experience in making the necessary upgrades. Staff met with AVI several times to develop a scope of work that would meet the needs related to the AV in the council chambers and the production room. Some of the key items that, that we went over as we discussed these, the first was the audience members have difficult time viewing and hearing the presentation. That was our biggest one. Second was we needed new monitors and microphones on the staff tables and up on the dais. Uh, we needed easier setup in giving presentations and we needed a timer at the podium and a, syst uh, a system for calling into city council meetings. So when, people, when you guys want to call in, um, an easier system than we have right now. And then complying with ADA standards, mainly up at the podium when people want to come up and assess that. And so um, those things were kind of our key components when we were talking about this project. So this contract addresses these key items. The first is a high quality projector will be installed and mounted near the crow's nest. It'll be right up there, kind of where it won't be in her view, but it'll be right underneath them. And it will be projected on the screen right here. It will be set so it only goes down halfway. So you won't have an issue of the council um, not being able to see out into the audience. Um, the, this projector is a high lumens projector at 9,000 which will, the clarity will be really clear. And so everybody in the council chambers will be able to see that and, and see it clearly. Uh, we really looked at the, we initially we were trying to figure out how we could mount mm -hmm. TVs on the side of the wall, but, but with the construction of this old building and the solid wall construction, it was just cost prohibitive. And so this really was a way that everyone can still see it. Speakers will be installed on the side panels to help with the audio. Um, Crestrons will help with audio-visual. They'll be installed here and on the other staff table and up in the crow's nest. All monitors and microphones will be replaced along with the mixer in the crow's nest to allow for the ability to increase and decrease the volume at your mics. Because sometimes when it gets transmitted at home through the video system, some, some come through really good and some are kind of quiet. Uh, there will also be a cordless microphone at the podium to allow people that cannot stand at the podium. A timer will be installed so you can be seen both at the council and out to the audience. <clears throat> there will also be some upgrades to the production studio and the crow's nest. So this was a capital improvement project that was approved with a budget of $150,000. This contract is for $131,024.03. So now I'd like to just introduce Chris Ruda, Rudy, Rudy sorry, um, from Audiovisual Innovations, and he's going to give a presentation and go into more details. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Please, my name's Chris. This is Matt Curtis. How you doing? Um, How you doing? <laughs> So, um, as he mentioned, the high-level overview, uh, just wanted to, we, we go over this and drill down as deep as you guys want to, or um, kind of high-level, so just let us know if we're speeding through too fast or not. Um, and, uh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt us should you have any questions uh, through the process. So on the, on the first piece here that we were talking about is the projector. The projection system that we, we've chosen to use is a 9,000 lumen laser LED projector. That projector has a 20,000 hour lamp life on it, so you don't really have to actually change the lamp on it. Um, and what it, where it'll be mounted is right there, essentially a little bit to the right, if you're looking back at where the clock is, it'll be mounted, so it'll be mounted below the, um, the window there so that she still has full view, but that the projector will actually fit onto this projection screen. This projection screen is an older style. It is a 4-3 aspect ratio, so more of that square style. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have it stop, so it'll actually stop in the 16-9 format, which would mirror the side displays. So it'll actually be a lot shorter, so it will not be in your headspace at all. So you will be able to walk under there easily, won't get in your eyes or anything. So that's the, the projection system that we've actually chosen for that. 
and you're not going to have to fuss with the, with the, you know, the stopping. It'll all be done through the programming of the, the touch panel control through the custom GUI. Correct. So for the um, video system inputs and locations where we'll be able to have potential computer sources, we do have one over here at the, this is considered the clerk's desk, correct? <laughs> So the clerk's desk. Um, we'll also have one up in the booth, and then there will be one from the podium here. Nope, so nope, this is gone. That side. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Two steps. So it was kind of originally, originally going to be here, but yeah. there. So three. Um, three so separate. there. Are, Laptop connections. Those would be physically be wired connections, so you don't have to worry about it being a, a wireless connectivity mm -hmm. where you might have your Wi-Fi down and you just can't show anything. Those are actually hardwired locations, so you don't have to worry about it ever. Potentially breaking that way. Um, those, are, those are managed through. Water. And those so are controlled. Or auto sensing. Yeah. So, so the way that they're set is via the control panel, the Crestron control panel that will be sitting here, here, or back up in the booth. You would be able to control and individually choose which input you want to go to which displays. Or what you can do is if there's only one plugged in at any of those spots, it'll just auto source to that. So if there's nothing plugged in and somebody plugs in at one of them, it'll just say, well, they must want to see that, and it'll automatically click right to it. So it's very easy to use. You don't have to push a bunch of buttons for it to work. Um, next there. So on the, on the uh, dais here, what we're planning on doing is replacing all of these desktop monitors that you see here. We're going to be replacing them with ultra-narrow bezel, 22 inch displays that will actually be able to lean back so you can keep them out of the line of sight like you are currently Wonderful. but so that there will be a, they'll be larger so you can actually see them a little bit better also like, and we won't have these the, the correct resolution also yeah, yeah. so, they're not, so the, the square screens they're, they're, they're not going to be these smaller ones that and you can see how they're popped up in the center there you're not going to have that issue anymore next screen there um, for the audio system what we had talked about um, for this audio system is that there will be speakers throughout the, throughout the room. There will be some from the front and also some from up the top that will be, end up for, be replacing the ones that are currently here. But what it will do is allow for a more full sound within the room while also keeping the total volume at a lower rate. So what essentially what will happen is let's say you're at a rock show like a concert and it's really loud up front but it's quieter as the farther you get back. That's because they have to push a lot of power through those front speakers. What we're going to do is, because there's going to be speakers all the way around, it'll allow for there to be less pumped out of each, each speaker, but it will fill more fully within the room. Um, along with that, we are going to be putting in a 48 input Allen and Heath mixer. I'm going to back up for a second. Okay. In addition to the uh, audio that we're going to, going to reinforce uh, throughout the area, we've also oh, yeah. got small um, speakers that will live separated um, appropriately at the dais to, to be able to um, amplify the audio for you. for you guys as well. Another thing I just forgot about also, out in the lobby out there, we will put some overflow speakers that will be available. So let's say that there's someone that can't be inside the room, how Chris and I were sit seated outside, you could turn those on quietly outside for, for folks that potentially get a phone call during a meeting, but they still want to be able to try to listen there will be some speakers out there that can be turned on or off independently of the whole of the internal system. Um, where I was getting to on the, the uh, mixing console, that'll be the new mixing console for up in the booth that is, is necessary just for the new wireless microphone systems, for the new wired microphones that are going to be at each one of these locations also, and as Chris had mentioned, the actual uh, speakers for all of them as well. Um, a nice thing that it has been kind of like is a little extra that was able to be put in is we can actually have a microphone up in the booth and the booth person would be able to speak down here as well. Did we take that one out? Okay. Never mind. Just kidding. No. Um, so, yeah, I see we kind of have, have moved things and, and made sure that we're keeping them all so it's simple. Um, yes, sir. Can we turn the microphones off and on? Yes. Okay. You will have independent mute per microphone instead of one all on, all off type of scenario. Um, there are multiple ways that we can actually set them up. You want to have to sneeze or something. Correct. 
or in case you want to talk about somebody. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people like to have them always hot, and then you press mute, or sometimes, you know, the opposite. With press to hot, talk. Yeah, or, press to talk. Yeah. So we can talk through that. And once you get um, comfortable with the system, I'm sure there's going to be some things that need to be worked out and, and touched up to make sure it's working the way you want it. So. Just to clarify <clears throat> from what Matt said, so the microphone that's going to be at the podium, it can be manually shut off from from up here or correct so one of the controllers this since this is going to be an actual wireless microphone now you won't have any cords draped across the floor it'll actually sit on a little on a little mic stand essentially and what will happen is that microphone can be controlled from any of the control locations so that somebody can mute it if this person <laughs> starts to go in a direction that's not wanted well, that, and there's going to be volume control in the in the kind of the admin settings that will allow you to so if you've got a mic eater that just talks right into it you can adjust that on the fly and, and tone that down. Well, especially for, for soft-spoken soft people or people that like to sit back while they're speaking, it, you can't hear them as well, but you can adjust in the way that we have it set up is you'll be able to adjust each person's individually throughout. So let's say they get really close because they're really ecstatic about the meeting. You can back them down a little bit so they're not so, so loud. And we work, we work in lockstep with with you guys to make sure that we've got all the tuning done, you know, the training's on point. So we kind of work on that at the end of the process, but just want to let you know that that is part of our process. Um, one more thing I wanted to know, this does, um, included in that number that you've mentioned, it does include a three-year warranty. So there's some there's some additional parts to that that so you guys are covering if things go wrong. And it's peace of mind that you guys have, uh, you know, to, to get this system, keep it, you know, to keep it working. Yeah, preventative maintenance and service. But the goal is to make, you know, when we went through this process to, you know, not give you guys gear that's going to break and make sure, you know, we take that into account because we want to, we don't want to have to look bad in a year saying, why'd you get us this cheapy stuff and, you know, it's broke. So, um, yeah. so in addition to the microphones, oh. we've got the Goose Deck microphones around the day has to be replaced. Um, we have two handheld wireless microphones and um, one lavalier for presentations outside of maybe this microphone um, and just kind of a multi-purpose uh, use for those particular mics. Um, as he had mentioned also, the uh, assisted listening, we're going to include uh, additional parts to that um, and make more available for um, those that need it. And really that covers kind of the audio. Um, just a quick question also on that. The control panel, is that stationary or is that something that we can take and lock up if other groups are, are in here and they wouldn't need to use that? How, well, how will that work? It, it is hardwired, um, so there's that. Uh, so unless somebody went in so the answer is no. and wanted to take it, um, I guess. But we could lock the system down. Yes. Correct. And that's, that, you know, through the programming, we can kind of work with you guys to say, hey, <coughs> you've got the um, public user where they basically have power on up, volume up, down. And, and that's it. <laughs> everything to map you your volume settings, you know, um, and other um, permissions past that to, to, yeah, to lock it down. Um, and another nicety is as, as well with the three <laughs> control panels that are going to be provided, there's also the ability for X panel. Essentially what X panel means is that any computer that is also on the same um, network as the AV control system, they would be able to, let's say on that laptop there, which is a wireless device, they could have the full control system and it is live in real time on that device. So say the so, morning you had a meeting, you're sitting at your desk in your office and you could access that from there and light up the room from your, from your laptop. Or if, so nice or if there's any issues in the room yeah. and a user comes in and is just pushing all the buttons and they're pushing all the wrong buttons, you can watch them and say, hold on a sec. You could push the correct button for them. That's a nice idea to have. <coughs> Next, yeah. So the timer. I know we wanted to clarify the timer. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to find out. The mayor's going to lose his job. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I did find out this. The picture doesn't do really what everything we're saying here, but there will be three different uh, timers. One that will live at a location at the dais. Um, two that will face toward the speaker. And then a monitor type uh, display that will face 
for you guys. So you can watch them. Then. So you'll be able to see at the same time that we're seeing from here, you'll be able to see on mine. And, and the, then the folks the, there will be able to see it as well. The timer will, will see it as well. So you can speed up the time if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, and, and and they are all they're in fully in conjunction. So they're they're connected via via wireless, so that they will always be connected. Now, the, we may need to drill into this to get that mounted. I yeah, it just it just mounts to the to the front face yeah. of it. So just uh, that's really kind of it for the system. I mean, like I don't know if you guys want us to get technical, um, but I think pretty good overview. Um, Basically refresh, you know, with the thought in mind to, to make you guys uh, kind of, like I said, move into the new resolutions important, you know, digital uh, upgrades is important, so we've kind of ta we've taken that already. And I'll assume maybe we'll have a little tutorial before we actually go live. Correct. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, we, we provide finish. full training. We also provide quick reference guides, which are essentially like a laminated, P, uh, laminated guide for every single push button that can also be sent out an email. Um, on, some, on some systems, we've even gone as far as to not allow people to schedule the room or use the room without go, getting it trained, without writing their name on a little piece of paper for us. So. Yeah, and we could do different levels of training too, you know, because there's only probably a few people that really want to know full details of all the systems. <laughs> and we can set up a couple meetings to, to take it. I've kind of been that guy for the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. You are. <laughs> Oh, as far as the streaming at home, the seeing and, and listening and everything, you're going to be able to have a much better time of it because all of the current cameras that are connected are also going into the system. The uh, microphones are going to be a very much better, higher level of microphone also. Yeah. Yes. I guess, yep. I guess, I guess the audio, <clears throat> kind of what, a big problem that sparked a lot of this was, wasn't the audio cutting in and out, and it was just mm -hmm. really cool. right. Yeah, so we've definitely Or not taken non-existent. Non-existent, yeah. yeah. Okay. Taking that into account. Yeah. Make sure that that'll, that will be handled. Okay. I just have one, uh, one last question, because we have four cameras in here at this time. Mm -hmm. So your system will support that, will it support other channel, more channels, or that has nothing to do with you? It can, it can, it can support more. It is done via a um, network distribution system, essentially. So it's kind of like a network switch. And we can actually mix and match and add more if we, if, if necessary. Okay. So it's future proofed. And based on the, the quality of these cameras, I, we didn't find it necessary to replace them at this time. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're still good. good. They're good cameras. Okay. okay. I'm just going to say we couldn't have got a better gift in 2020. Yeah. Uh, than than what's being done here. This is just amazing. And Steve, I, I think that you uh, did a heck of a job, my friend. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yeah, questions. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to work with you guys. Yep. Again, I, I know we'll knock it out the park. We've got some crazy, nerdy audio guys that love this kind of stuff. So oh, good. They definitely will take into account the sensitivity of tuning the system and seeing that, you know, all, all links up right. Um, there's a lot of different layers to this with the production room and that kind of thing. So okay. it'll be a little bit of hand-holding, but we'll be good. <laughs> good deal. Thank Sooner the better. Time. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like you know what you're doing. <coughs> All right. Anything else, Stephen? Do you have anything you want to add? No, just just the last. I mean, in the regular council meeting, we'll be approving this contract. So okay. I, I can give the presentation again. Or no, that's good. No, I think we're good. I think they did a good job. All right. We'll stand adjourned until seven o'clock. Thank you.